<laughs> you got it. Like, welcome to the webinar, y'all. <laughs> I'm gonna stop this now. There we go. <laughs> welcome to the webinar, everyone. <laughs> Jillian, I asked her um, if she could have a walk-up song, what would it be? Because we, let, let's introduce walk-up songs. And um, she said, Chance the Rapper. And I thought, well, you know what? Let's do this. So um, thank you for getting through a couple seconds of uh, Ch Chance the Rapper. Ch excuse the, the accent, Chance the Rapper. All right, let's get things kicked off. And as anyone else joins, we can always just say hi and welcome you to the show today. So welcome, everyone. So glad you are here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. We are so glad you're joining us for the webinar today. And I am joined by the incredibly smart, brilliant, lovely, Jillian Richardson. She's the founder of The Joyless in New York City. If you're in New York City, raise your hand. This is awesome. And uh, we're going to be talking about why companies should stop spending money on ads and invest in community and why that's so important. I'm going to go through a few things. Uh, why are you here? How you landed up here? And why it's important that you stay here. Um, as we go through this um, webinar today, you can book a meeting with Jillian. And this is is a code for 50% off your meeting with Jillian. It is Jillian50. You can add that in at, um, on the platform and you'll be able to go from there. So again, I'll, I'll flash this again toward the end of the webinar so that you can write it down, screenshot it, take a photo, etch it into your desk, whatever you'd like to do. Um, I'm Tammy McQueen. I'm the VP of Partnerships at Common Genius. I'll be moderating the webinar, fielding your questions, uh, getting them queued up for the Q&A, and helping you with any sort of uh, hand raises, anything else. Technical webinar admin is Lucy Sue. She is an absolute rock star on this platform. She keeps me and Jillian in line and helps this action <laughs> today. Without Lucy, this would not be possible. And so if this were an Oscar speech, she would be the one that I'd be thanking first to actually help us get this going. So Lucy is in the background and and really running behind the scenes and we'll be making sure that we answer your questions attend to any um, glitches or technical issues as well so thank you so much Lucy we are so thankful you're here um, all right common genius this is why you're here we're so glad you joined uh, what does it do you can search for an expert such as Jillian um, it makes it simpler than ever really to get answers from complex problems from world-renowned experts whether they are mentors coaches investors uh, industry leaders um, influencers per se and experts in your field um, or industry from around the world it makes it really simple to search for them find their rates and what they're talking about as well um, what can you search by if you're not really sure who you want to speak to or you want to do a broad search you can search by category so if you're looking for marketing you can look for nonprofit community business um, investing they is um, an endless amount of searches that you can run to be able to find the expert you're looking for. Um, and then you can also um, look at different specialties, education, certifications, and then view their profiles as well. You're also able to message the expert before you book a meeting to say, hey, is this something you can dive into? Or would you like to really dive into the specific topic that I have questions about? So there's no need that you can set a meeting. And you're not really sure if that's the person you want to talk to or if it is the right fit for what you're looking for. So that makes it really simple to do as well. Um, now, without further ado, I am going to introduce you to Jillian. She said that she absolutely wants to introduce herself here. Yeah? I thought, you know what, I can't do that any better than you can. But I want to tell you that if you are in New York City, or if you're visiting New York City, or if you spend quite a bit of time in the city, um, the Joyless is an incredible resource to scheduling different and curating events where you can go and you know absolutely no one, but you don't have to be standing in the corner. You can go alone 
meet with a friend and it's real yes. community connections. And I'm gonna let Jillian expand on that, but I told her that I'll be in the city in a couple of weeks and I am absolutely in on this action. So um, yes. I'll have to you, Jillian, we are going to keep Q&A to the very end so we can cram yeah. all the business into the webinar and then uh, we'll make sure that we moderate the, the Q&A. So have fun, everyone. I'm so excited about this and Jillian is an absolute boss. So thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us. Thank you, Tammy. Oh my goodness, this is such good vibes in here. I was not expecting we would start with a, like a little mini dance party. Um, so typically, I don't know how the hell this is gonna go but I like to start my talks with a group breath. Uh, since we're all on our computers, I'm just gonna pretend like you all are here. At the very least, I'm gonna take a breath for myself. So everyone who's at your computers, even if you're in like a public space in a coffee shop, whatever, you're just breathing, it's not weird. So if we collectively take a breath in and like squeeze your shoulders and squeeze your face if you don't feel weird about it and just like squeeze it really, really tight, and let it out with a sigh. Ha. Hello. Cool. We're like a little more grounded now. I'm a little more grounded now. And I would love to start my talk with a story to give you a little bit of context of who I am. So a few months ago, I was at a conference called Celebrate You. And I was brought in to facilitate a conversation at the end of the day for the female entrepreneurs who were there. So I start this circle by letting the women know who I am. I say, hi, my name is Jillian Richardson. I'm the founder of The Joy List, which is a weekly newsletter of events that you can go to by yourself and leave with a new friend in New York City. And our mission is to make the world a less lonely place. I am also the founder of, the founder, the author of a book called Unlonely Planet, which again is about how to make the world a less lonely place. And so by this point, I have said the word lonely many times. I look at the women in this circle and I notice that they seem a little bit tense. And I wonder, I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have brought lon loneliness up so much. And so to start the conversation with these women, I say, I would love for everyone to go around and share their name and something that they're struggling with that they would like help with from the women in the circle. And it's a circle of 10 women super diverse in terms of race, in terms of age, in terms of ability level. We have a, we had one woman there who was chronically ill. And since it's a business conference, I'm expecting them all to say, like needing help with social media, needing help with connections to investors, that kind of thing. And what happens next completely blows my mind. These women go around and I would say seven out of 10 of them say that they need help with forming real friendships in their life. And they need help with creating connection. And these women share with me that they have never told someone this before, that this is something that they have never told their partner, they have never told their children, that they feel this sense of disconnection that they don't know what to do with. And what surprised me the most was that there were these two women who were sitting next to each other, who were sitting next to each other for the whole conference. And I found out that they were best friends who both had a daughter who recently left for college. And both of these women were the loneliest they'd ever been in their lives. They're single moms by themselves. They live blocks away from each other. And they were so ashamed to reach out to their friend and say that they wanted more connection and more time with them because they didn't wanna be a burden. And yet when we had this space to talk about our need for connection, all of these women finally could share out loud how much they were craving it. And so here I am at this business conference and I realize that talking about loneliness really matters and talking about connection really matters. And for all of you, I'm guessing a lot of you are small business owners, this should matter to you because your job is to solve consumer pain points. And right now, from where I'm standing, the number one consumer pain point in America is loneliness. It's what I've seen from my own personal experience running this newsletter and hearing other people's stories. And it's also what I've heard from research. And so you all, I'm guessing, probably a numbers crowd, 
numbers are great. So I have some stats to prove to you that loneliness is actually as big of an issue as I'm making it out to be. So one, if I was doing this in front of you all, I would ask you to guess, but we're doing slides. So the answer is very obvious. Um, the average person in the United States only has one close friend, one. And to make things worse, 75% of people are not satisfied with the friendships that they do have. And that's extra bad because loneliness is directly tied to an early death. So if you identify as lonely, you are just as likely to die an early death as if you smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. And loneliness is also tied to an early mortality just as much as excessive drinking or obesity. So if you think about how much we talk about obesity, excessive drinking, even just in a high school health class, this, these topics come up so often. Yet when it comes to forming authentic connections and real friendship, it's something we barely talk about. And again, because there's this sense of shame of not knowing how to have it, not feeling enough, not feeling connected, feeling embarrassed, we don't know how to feel connected. And that's something that we can all solve by creating spaces for authentic connection. So if there's one thing that you get from my talk today, it is this, that as companies, you can do the world a service by using your advertising dollars less and taking those and creating spaces for connection more. And so I have this cartoon as a way to illustrate this in case you're just listening or if you're not looking at the screen, it's one guy saying to a boardroom, what do we know about Generation Z so that we can get them to buy stuff? And the people on the board say, so far, all we know is that they hate brands that try to get them to buy stuff. So there's actually a study that Eventbrite did with millennials to see where they like to spend their dollars. And it's been proven that millennials actually, they focus less on buying things and focus way more on buying experiences. So as a company, if you can create an experience for people to come together and you solve their most painful point, which is loneliness, you will have a far more loyal brand following than if you simply were targeting them with an Instagram campaign or a billboard. Now, it's easy for me to say, cool, create spaces for connection and for love and get people to drop their walls and be with each other. But how do you actually do that? Well, with my newsletter, I have curated thousands of events in the past three years. I've hosted my own conference, Hustle Fest, which was a conference for people who want to go from full time to freelance. I've hosted that conference three times. I've hosted dozens of meditation and conversation circles. I've hosted my own social for hundreds of people multiple times. I have seen what it is like to create a space where people can really connect. And I've distilled it down to four basic things. So one, is to create what I call clear hurdle rules. And this means a rule that when you look at the event page, you kind of think to yourself, ooh, like I'm not sure if I actually wanna be in that space. It's something that might be a little bit difficult to do. So that could be, this is a sober space. We're not going to be drinking. It could be, we're not going to be using our phones. It could be uh, one that I absolutely love. It's my friend who is a CEO and he hosts uh, founder dinners. His hurdle rule is everyone has to show up in a onesie. And so the reason, so like Tammy likes that one. Um, the reason to have these rules is so that even if someone shows up by themselves and they're in this space, they know that they have one big thing in common with everyone there. So for the founders dinner, you'd walk in and say, okay, I know I'm with founders who don't take themselves too seriously, that they're willing to be silly, they're willing to show up at this dinner and not be in a suit. They're willing to be here dressed like a dragon or a unicorn. And it immediately creates a unifying effect just because of that one rule. So one, clear hurdle rules. Two is to greet people with intention. As I'm sure I've experienced this, walking into a space where I don't know anyone in this really overwhelming anxiety feeling of what do I do here? I don't know who to talk to. I don't know how to start a conversation. So to prevent that from happening, by when someone comes in the door, greeting them with two things. And the first thing is just kind words and saying that you're excited that this person is in this space, 
saying that you see this person, asking them if they have any questions, asking if they want to be introduced to somebody in the room, and then also giving them something tangible if you can. Something as simple as a piece of chocolate or a cup of tea goes a really long way in helping people feel welcome in this space and knowing that you're excited that they're there and that they matter. So one, clear hurdle rules. Two, greet with intention. Three is behavior modeling. So this means you need to act in a way that models the type of space that you want to create. So for example, if you want people to feel really comfortable dancing their face off at your dance party, you're gonna need to be out there on the dance floor making a fool of yourself so that people can visually see it is safe for me to act in this way, in this space. That type of behavior is acceptable here. A thing that's more applicable to business is if you are facilitating a dinner party and you want people to be vulnerable and kind of drop that business facade, it is your job to tell a vulnerable story first and to set that bar and to show people, I trust you with this and you can trust me. So that's behavior modeling. And the last one is closing with the call to action. So in the book, which I super recommend, cannot recommend it enough, there's a book called The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. And in it, she reminds her readers that people remember the beginning and the end of an event the most. Those are the things that stick out in their mind. And so in the last moments of your event, you get to tell your audience what you hope they do. You get to tell them whatever you hope they remember. So by closing with the call to action, you actually increase the, the chances that this thing actually happens. So for example, I spoke at Startup Grind, the conference in California, and a great example for them is, I hope that you leave today having a coffee date with two people who you met in this auditorium. Immediately, that gives people permission, one, to talk to new people, to schedule a coffee date, and it reminds them that everyone is there with that intention, that everyone is in this space to create connection because it's so easy to feel like we're the only one who wants connection and that everyone else is there with their friends and they don't need anyone else. But really, that is the intention of the space. Okay, I'm gonna skip these two slides. And so now, so we talked about how to create spaces for connection but it might be hard to imagine how this actually impacts your business's bottom line. It's great to say that we should have spaces for connection, but why does that matter for you as a business? So I'm gonna use my business, which is the Joy List, the newsletter and event series as an example. So as you see on this slide, the Joy List's mission is to end the loneliness epidemic by spotlighting and hosting events that offer moments of facilitated connection, vulnerability, and playfulness. And we're trying to shift culture globally from being centered around drinking and surface level conversations to prioritizing meaningful connection and community. And the umbrella goal is that with the Joy List, people in cities around the world will feel more seen, heard, and understood. And that mission resonates with people a lot. So as you can see from these numbers, a basic overview. So my email list, we have 4,000 subscribers. On Facebook, we have 9,000 followers. And these are pretty much all people in New York City. With So we use MailChimp, MailChimp, MailChimp to track the emails. We have a 38.2% open rate and a 10% click-through rate for our weekly emails, which if you're not familiar, that's two times the industry average for an email campaign because people are genuinely excited to open these emails. The amount of people who've told me, I unfollowed every events newsletter that I get. I unfollow most newsletters, but this is the thing that I open because I know that it's going to be valuable to me. And also people love our in-person events. And I know this because one, we sell out our events. Our events have, we cap out at a hundred people. And my last event, uh, it was so popular that people started selling counterfeit tickets, if you believe it. People started selling counterfeit tickets. It was not a Beyonce concert. This is a thing where people are going to drink kombucha and make new friends. And it was so popular. There were counterfeit tickets sold. And that popularity translate to, translates to MailChimp. You can see that the open rate that's specifically an email for the event is 84.8%. And the click-through rate for that, for that email is 45.5%, which is very, very high. 
And also these are these are just some numbers on so on on Facebook we have a calendar that compiles all of our events and you can see how high the attendance is for these events, how many people are visiting our page every month. And this is because we are curating events that have a facilitated moment of connection. We are giving people something that they desperately want. And because of that, that's translating to click through rates, that's translating to ticket sales, that's translating to fan loyalty. So I guess before I do the q and I'll just, here, wait, I'll go back to a prettier page while I say this. <laughs> there we go. Here are some pictures for my events. Look at all these people who are hugging each other. Um, so before I do Q&A, I just want to re rephrase what I want you all to get from this talk, which is one that as companies, I believe that you should use traditional advertising less and create spaces for connection more because that will create a very loyal brand following, especially if you're trying to target Gen Z or millennials. And also to create spaces for connection, there are four things that you can do. One, greet with intention. Two, close with the call to action. Three, model the behavior that you want to see. And four, greet with it. Nope, hurdle rules, hurdle rules. That was the thing that I didn't say. So yeah, those images should just give you a little sense of what the vibe is at our spaces. But Tammy, I'll let you transition to Q&A. Awesome. No, thank you so much, Jillian. And would you um, go back to the slide of four? I think that's really helpful for folks to, to really think about and maybe it'll spur some questions as yes. well as to there we go. the rules, greeting with intention. And I love your intro. I'm all about experiences and it's, it's really and truly great stories happen to those who can tell them. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's about that emotion and that empathy that you can invoke that allows you to connect with people on such a deeper level than a, a swipe across ad. Um, and so I'd love to, as you said, open up to Q&A. Folks, if you want to go ahead and just type your message in, um, in the chat, you can see where it says public. Go ahead and just drop a note there, whether it is about getting hold of um, Jillian's new book that's uh, releasing in July of this year. Um, if you want to know yes. a little bit about that, if you want to know about what a great closing CTA would be, that would be mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, I'll go ahead and start to get some questions going and maybe fuel the curiosity as well. Jillian. Yeah. Tell us about one of the most memorable experiences you've had in curating one of these events in New York. Oh my goodness. I think one was the first time I had my own Joylist social. So by this point, I had been sending out the newsletter every week for a year and a half. And every newsletter I send, I start with the vulnerable story for my week because I want to model the vulnerability that I want to see in the world. So that could be a story from my experiences with having an eating disorder to struggling to find love in New York City to feeling disconnected from my purpose and my career. Anything where there's a little bit of like, Look, this is scary to share, but I want these conversations to be more public. Um, and so when I finally brought together my subscribers in person in real life, <laughs> But yeah, so the first time I actually had an in-person event, not just online community, but an in-person community, I was going around and I was asking people, like, what brought you here? Have you been to other Joylist events? And I was shocked to hear how many people had been following my newsletter every week for a year and a half just to hear my stories and that my event was the first space that they'd felt comfortable enough to actually really get out of their comfort zone and be there and meet new people because they trusted that anyone who followed my brand and who was a fan of me was someone that they would get along with. And they trusted that I would create a space where they could feel safe. That's awesome. And I think um, it just really highlights to me how vulnerability and communication with your audience, it's one, I know that it's very difficult, but also that it's so important and it can create loyalty with your customers like nothing else. Like I was shocked how many people said like, oh my gosh, I love your newsletter. I read it every week, but I was too scared to go to any of your events until you personally were hosting one. 
That's amazing. I love that you're able to level set with that vulnerability and folks truly resonated with that so, so much. Um, I have my next question for you while we're um, waiting for some of the Q&A to come through is perhaps a lot of the folks that may be on the chat are um, mentors. They may be um, uh, enthusiasts in building their community as well. Um, you talk about not really focusing on ads and sometimes that is the only approach folks have without being able to grow their community. Maybe they don't have a large list already and maybe it takes a longer period of time to do so. Um, how do you encourage folks to stick with it, stay consistent and keep focusing on nurturing and building a community before, you know, really putting money behind ads or, or not being in that capacity to do so? Yeah, I would say that, well, one, me having my own events started spreading the word of my newsletter way quicker. Like the fact that I was bringing people together, suddenly I was getting requests uh, to be interviewed for the press. Suddenly, like the, the rate of subscribers was going way up. And it was because I had 100 people in a space all going out into the world, sharing with their friends what I created. So mm -hmm. even if that's on a smaller scale, even if like if you have a female centered product, like a product that's just for women and you create a once a month women's circle, you're going to be creating, even if it's 10 women, 10 brand ambassadors for your company, because you are creating a space for them that women really are looking for right now. And sure. they're going to associate those good feelings from that circle with your company. And they're going to be talking about it way more than if maybe a thousand people see an ad online, they're not going to be telling their friends. But if 10 women have a really great connected experience in person, they're going to be talking about it. That's such a great perspective. And I think uh, to your point in answering that question is really, it's not necessarily about comparing yourself to the largest scale events that are out there or the mega events. It's not necessarily like that. And it's the comparison is the thief of joy, as we have heard many times, though, is mm -hmm. what can you do to make an impact in your community? And how can you really find this in specific niches, whether it is as niche as a woman group in a specific area for a, a specific industry. So I think yeah. that's really important. Thanks for sharing that, Julianne. Um, we're getting some questions in here and I want to touch on them. Um, a lot of them, I think we've got folks in other cities that are anxious for you to be in these yes. cities. Um, you know, tell us a little bit more. Curious if the Joyless is in San Francisco. Are you in yeah. other cities? Where, well, help us, what's going on here? Yes, so the plan this year is to expand the joy list all around the world. So if you go to the website joylist.nyc, you'll see a little tab that says add your city. And it's a place to either let me know if you just want the newsletter in your city in general, or if you're interested in leading the newsletter in your city yourself. Because right now I'm honestly in the phase of figuring out what systems to have in place so mm -hmm. I can effectively manage multiple cities at the same time. And then once those are ready, because I think I have 25 cities already where people have volunteered to lead. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they're ready. I just need to have my systems in place so things can go as smoothly as possible. That's awesome. That's exciting. All right. So we're going to go ahead, put it on the website. What city you'd love to include? Um, that's awesome. That's exciting to hear. Uh, Tina, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Nick, um, we ha are you aware whether this loneliness trend is a largely Western trend, for example, in Australia? And how do you make these mm -hmm. scalable while maintaining authenticity, um, such as how do you train people for the events that in embody a lot of the same energies that you put forth and that authenticity and vulnerability at your core mission? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Nick, what a good question. Well, I know loneliness, are you, I'm guessing you're saying Australia is like part of the Western trend. Cause I know in Australia, there's a lot of campaigns right now to work on reducing loneliness. Um, there's this beautiful project of um, like, I know in Australia, men above 50, they're really likely to be depressed and they're the highest, they're at highest risk of committing suicide. 
And so in Australia, they started creating these tool sheds, essentially. They're literally just tool sheds where men can come and work on projects for free. And it was a way to help men who were in their 50s and 60s meet each other, bond, form friendships in a really natural way. So I know that this definitely is an issue in America, in England, in Australia. To be honest, other countries, I haven't done as much research. Most of my research has centered in America because that's where I feel like I can create the most change. So I'm not totally sure about other countries. And so scaling while maintaining authenticity. Sorry, what were you gonna say, Tammy? No, I was about to say that I think in able to have that process that you developed to be able to take that and create a scalable and repeatable model in other cities mm -hmm. around the world is, is a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, and that that's the thing that I'm working on right now and talking to people about. And I think one is definitely having trainings Definitely having, because for me, I just essentially have a template of like, this thing happens and this thing happens, this thing happens. And the way to maintain authenticity, at least that I figured out so far, is making sure that that city lead feels like they have the power to do what they want with that format. Like really for me, the Joyless Social, the format is as simple as there's a greeting experience. There is a introduction in the middle about what the Joyless is, why people are there, giving people a new question to talk to each other about and then a closing circle. And so that's very loose. That person can interpret that however they want. They can bring in whatever artists they want, whatever performers they want. And so I'm hoping that because there is that empowerment, it will still feel authentic and it will still feel like it belongs to that person and not like the Joylist brand, if that makes sense. Awesome. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Um, and next one from Nina. It says, if you are tar targeting younger people, for example, 15 year olds, have mm -hmm. you got any ideas about how to create appealing in person events for this age group? In addition to creating something that appeals to them enough, you also have to overcome the hurdle of their parents trusting the events and being willing to bring them to the events. Ooh, I'm so curious, Nina, what type of event for 15 year olds you're you're thinking of making because I'm guessing it's not connected to schools if you could add more information that'd be super helpful but I can share I've actually been talking to colleges about designing their orientation program for them um, I'm talking specifically to the Manhattan School of Music and they actually have students from around 15 years old because it's a music college, people can be way younger and join. Um, and for them, I know their biggest concern was, we wanna have an event where our students from across class lines and from across racial lines can come together and actually have authentic connection. And also their concern was, we wanna make sure this feels cool. Like this doesn't need to feel like this, some, this is something we're forcing on them. We want this to be an experience that they're really excited to be a part of and we're not like forcing the lesson down their throat. Um, so just from talking to them, I would say the biggest thing in making something seem appealing is that it seems cool. And like for, for this school, they really wanted to focus on having facilitators who are around like 10 years older than the students at that school so that we still seem relatable and that whatever we're saying that it actually lands with those students. So like me bringing in my really cool, like sound bath people from New York City and bringing in, this sounds silly a little bit, but like people who are kind of like really attractive, like people who are like aspirational so that the students are really excited to be in this space with them and extra excited to listen to what they have to say. That's awesome. Nina follows up with that um, and she agrees with you how we're built, they are building an academic and career support app um, mm. and not to be affiliated with the school, to be a little cooler and want to find underrepresented, um, and whoa, I had an extra syllable, three syllables on that word, underrepresented ambitious students and give them tools um, that they oh, can level up, level up their, their opportunities. Um, all right. Thank you, Nina, for sharing that. We have one from Tina. Um, are you, and she's very curious, if you have events that break down generational silos, connecting um, younger people with older people. So for example, older people can't go to events as often due to mobility issues. So curious around that. 
Yeah, this is such a great point. I think about this all the time. Actually, in my book, I have a chapter about how we are lacking eldership in spaces right now and how intergener intergenerational spaces, especially in big cities, are really lacking. So I really resonate with your point that it is important to have spaces where, ooh, I think I lost, ooh, what is going on? There's so many things happening over here. Um, but that these inter intergenerational spaces are really important. If you actually, if you go to the Joylist website, so it's joylist.nyc, there's a tab that says resources. And there's a document that says master list of community building resources. And on that page, I have a bunch of projects that I think do a really good job of creating community. Uh, there's one called the Intergenerational Friendship Project. <laughs> so like literally that, they are creating spaces for people to come together across, across age generations. There's also a thing called Nuns and Nuns, N-U-N-S and N-O-N-E-S. And they take older women religious and they pair them with young millennials to have conversations. And that's a thing that I'm thinking about and I don't really know the answers to of how to make intergenerational spaces more popular because I've heard from so many Joylist readers, like I wanna go to the events on your newsletter. Will I stand out because I'm 60 years old? And I have to be honest with them and say, yes, you are going to stand out and you will be welcome. But I think a lot of people are just too self-conscious to, to be the only one of whatever type of person. Uh, and so being conscious about that diversity and ideally having intergenerational leadership from the start of an event is the best way to actually naturally have that audience be there. Awesome. Um, thank you. I think this is so insightful. And um, we have two more questions coming in. Um, a follow up is from Nick. And um, he asked a, a previous question about Australia and whether that is tied to Western trends. And um, a little bit of additional questions. What are the average demographics? graphics distribution of your events? Are they mostly mm -hmm. female? Are they age brackets? Do you typically see uh, university age students attending as well? Yeah, so my events, I would say, judging by what I've seen from my Facebook data, my events are like 65% female. So a little skewing more female, which I think makes sense considering I'm a woman who is creating this newsletter. Uh, and it's also a lot of events in the mindfulness space, which women tend to like more. And when it comes to university students, I can't speak for the other events on my newsletter, um, but for my event, the Joylist Social, my volunteers tend to be a lot of students who are going to university. Uh, actually, I think some of my most loyal volunteers and event attendees are university students. And I think that's because they're in that painful transition point where they're new to the city, they're looking for ways to contribute, they don't have a lot of money. So volunteering is great. They don't have to pay for the ticket and they get to meet a lot of people. That's been amazing. Uh, yeah. And also I would say my most loyal in terms of gender, actually, interestingly enough, I think my most loyal followers are men because they haven't been as exposed to spaces where they can drop their wallets and be vulnerable. So my biggest advocates, like the ones who were like number one super fans, they're all men. Awesome. Love it. Um, we have a question from Marcus, and his question is, if your initial audience is online or an online community, what are the best ways to inspire them to create and model their own community where they are able to help combat loneliness? Excellent That question. is such a great question. Uh, an example I can give, my friends, uh, Tony Bacigalupo and Casey Rosengren, they just hosted this thing last week actually called the gathering summit so if you look up the gathering summit you'll be able to see all of this but what they did was they had a virtual online conference so all the speakers were released every day and they were pre-recorded videos but they encouraged people from cities around the world to host their own in-person gatherings to watch these videos and have conversations about them and it was so cool to see that i think one they had tapped on a need which is that community builders are really hungry to be in gatherings with each other. We're really hungry to be there in person and exchange advice and just talk through our problems in person. And so just having this conference was essentially an excuse to get them together. So thinking about 
what is the problem that your community has and how can you help them address that problem in person? Why is it important for them to be having these conversations in person? And it's probably going to be because it is something a little bit more vulnerable. Uh, I'm curious, Marcus, if you wouldn't mind sharing like what your online community is so I could give you some more information. But if you don't want to share, that's totally fine. Awesome. All right, we'll wait for that to come in if Marcus drops that in. Any other questions, folks? We're nearing the end of the webinar and I wanna squeeze in as many questions as I can before I wrap up and do some housekeeping on Common Genius. Let's see. Also, um, you can follow Jillian on Twitter. It is that Jillian, at yeah. that Jillian. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, and also my website too, if you want to learn more just about me in general, my website is also thatjillian.com. And my that. other email is thatjillian at gmail.com. That Jillian. All right. Um, Ooh, cityrepair.org. <laughs> Tina, that sounds amazing. Ooh. The question is, does your list have places where people gather? That's a movement trying to recreate them. That way they mm. use when they lived in villages, the way that they used to live in villages. It sounds, Jillian, that it sounds like you're question. working with this and you're getting it. Can you take it from here? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so again, on the Joylist website, if you go to resources and then master list of community building resources, there is a section where I talk about projects that I think do a great job of creating community. Uh, I'm forgetting the exact name of it, but there's something like the Sustainable City Project, something like that. You're gonna have to look at the list, but there are resources that I've collected of more like government funded initiatives to create more sense of community within cities. Awesome. Oh That's my God. Mark. Okay, so I see Marcus. He's followed uh, up that. Awesome. Yeah, Marcus followed up. It's a podcast encouraging honest conversations in real community. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So for you, I would love, and I would love to have a conversation with you in general about this because this is so important. Um, but I'm guessing you could get people who would volunteer to lead small conversation groups and ask them to invite their friends and maybe have a different theme every month or like bi-weekly, depending on how often you want to have these conversation circles. Uh, and just make sure it's clear what the benefits are of leading these circles to say like, if you are leading these circles, you get to be in a position of authority. You get to learn how to facilitate, which facilitating is such an amazing skill to learn. Like you get to create space for people to connect and drop their walls. And as someone who has experience being a facilitator, it has been such a gift for me to create space for other people to heal. And that's what it sounds like your spaces are doing. Um, if you want to email me, I have so many thoughts. I have so many thoughts about this. Like this is a thing. Like I can send you some conversation agreements. Conversation agreements are so important. Uh, I could go on. Awesome. That is, that's awesome. Marcus, I'd love for you to connect with Jillian and, and take that a step further. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I think that wraps up the Q&A. Again, if you want to reach out to um, Jillian, that Jillian on Twitter, that Jillian.com. And we also have um, that Jillian um, at gmail.com. Yeah. Oh, wait, one more, one more, one more. Um, let's do one more from Nick. If I were to request leading a circle in my city, would I be able to focus on specific areas, i.e. well-being meditation? Oh, I think this is for Marcus. Oh, Marcus? Nick, I'm guessing Mar that you're asking Marcus if you can lead a circle, like a conversation circle around well-being. If that's the case, I guess figure out how to talk to Marcus. If or if you're talking about leading the joy list in your city, what I'm hoping is having a few city leads for each major city. So for example, there's gonna be one major joy list LA city lead, and then a few subject matter experts. So like the dance person, the meditation person. So if that's what you're interested in, um, 
again, filling out the city request on the Joylist website would be the best way to go. Awesome. And then um, with more questions as well, book you, you're able to book a meeting. As we mentioned in the beginning, um, there is a promo code 50% off your meeting, Jillian50. So I'm sure there are a lot of um, additional questions that you have um, where you can really go in depth with uh, Jillian. I know it's really tough to pack all this in and some of you are really working on a lot of these initiatives in your own city. Mm -hmm. and building communities and inspiring hopes um, and bringing joy to the hearts, minds and souls of people all over the world. So um, book a meeting with Jillian, Jillian 50 for 50% off. You can dive into this um, more in depth and really tailor the the content to you specifically. So I'll encourage you to do that. I'm gonna close off the Q&A for now um, and I wanna wrap it up um, with a few things. I'm gonna speed through some of these slides, Jillian. Um, this gives you a quick glimpse at all the pictures we looked at, the pretty pictures. And <laughs> keep going, I'm gonna keep going. Here we go, almost there, Q&A. All right, and this is where we are. Again, screenshot that, Jillian50. Um, you can use that when you can book a meeting with Jillian and she'll be able to uh, dive in. Again, um, commongenius.com, you can search for Jillian directly in the search panel. All right, again, what does Common Genius do? You can search for an expert. If you were to go and search for Jillian, you're able to find um, a Common Genius expert by searching Jillian Richardson, and she will pop up. You'll be able to see her on the screen, and you'll be able to book a meeting. Um, once you get to that page, you can enter Jillian50 for the promo for being on this webinar. Um, again, you can search um, experts by category. So if this webinar inspired you to learn more about creating or building communities or understanding how to leverage what you're doing, or perhaps there's some sort of knowledge gap that you feel like you, you really need to hone in on, or you're working on a side hustle, or you are trying to polish up the skills that you have, you're able to search by category and message those experts before you book a full one-on-one -on -one video meeting with them. Again, thank you all so much for joining us. And again, I encourage you uh, to book a meeting with Jillian, spend some time with her one-on-one. -on -one. She's awesome. We had a bit of a dance party beforehand. <laughs> if you did not catch that, it is on the recorded version. So <laughs> join us. It might be um, edited out, but I doubt it will be. I'm gonna, I'm Don't gonna do it. <laughs> Again, let's make this world a less lonely place. Go out there, make connections, and really foster building communities. Jillian, thank you so much for joining us. It is such a pleasure. Oh my goodness. Thank, thank you. Thank you for giving me this platform. This has been so fun. Absolutely. Wherever you are, if you're finishing up your lunch, you're going into breakfast um, or closing off for the evening, thank you so much for joining us and for joining Common Genius and being part of the platform. We um, appreciate you. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon.